Hello and welcome to Foreign Policy Focus, episode 30. I am the show's host, Kyle, and i uh, got quite a few news stories to talk about today. Um, as always, if you like the show, please share the show with anybody who you think may be interested and gain to know a little bit more about foreign policy. It's such an important topic, and if we can rein in America's foreign policy, maybe we can have some peace and prosperity in this country. The first story I want to talk about is uh, about the U.S. missile defense system. Uh, we have some experts coming out and warning that the missile defense system uh, doesn't work as well as the U.S. government claims. I think most Americans feel like the U.S. defense system System is either 100% effective or near 100% effective so that if China or Russia or North Korea ever launched a missile at the United States, the missile would certainly take, uh, the missile defense system would certainly take out that nuclear warhead or that missile and protect the United States of America. However, this, this isn't true and there's been reports over time that have kind of shown that at best these things are maybe 50% effective. Um, that numbers are hard to tell because uh, I guess there's like, you know, some national security type stuff along these lines if the if a opposing country knew like how effective uh the u.s missile defense systems were and they were like 50 percent effective then they figure you know they launch 40 newts instead of 20 and then have them get through right however uh, a lot of times they set up these tests and they you know launch the missile and then they'll have the u.s missile go in and try to take out that missile and it just doesn't work the missile gets through and so um as an American, this is, this is important information to know as we're voting for our elected officials, right? If we have a false sense of security, then uh, I think Americans would feel more secure in being more hostile to towards nuclear powers or countries that may want to launch missiles at the U.S. So if we feel really confident that there's no way that Russia would ever be able to attack the United States, then, you know, it, we could put a whole bunch of troops in Eastern Europe. We could fight Russia and proxy wars in Syria and over Iran and things like this. But if we, uh, if, if we're not sure, if we're afraid that Russia could nuke the United States, then maybe we take a little bit more of a careful approach to these type of, of things. And so I, I believe that our politicians, the national uh, security state as it is, uh, are, you know, just about anybody in the U.S. government, the military, has really led us to believe that our missile defense systems are very accurate. And the media never questions this narrative. I've never heard anybody on Fox News or CNN go, wait, how effective are our missile defense systems? And ask some critical questions on if you you know Russia has thousands of nuclear weapons, if Russia decided to launch a thousand nuclear weapons at the United States, why would a missile defense system be able to take care of that? I mean, these are important questions and important things for the American people to know. Uh, like I you know was getting into before, you know, is just it, our foreign policy depends on how well our defense is. Putting all uh, like you know principles and the offense of inter- interventionism aside, I I think a lot of people feel like uh, that the more the the stronger your defense is the more offensive you could be and you know uh, i think maybe an easy way to explain this would be you know using like a football analogy if a team has a really good defense then it may not be such a bad strategic move to go for it on fourth and one at your 50 yard line however if your defense is pretty terrible then you may not want to go for it there because you know punt the ball make them them go further and so if Americans think that the the defense of America is stronger than it is, it's going to lead Americans into making poor decisions. And I certainly think we've already seen some of those consequences play out, especially uh, during the general election. A lot of people supporting Hillary Clinton and her very, very antagonist approach towards Russia, thinking that Russia would never be able to retaliate against the United States, but in fact they can. I also think this has some pretty significant consequences for our uh, allies, especially those allies in the the Asia Pacific area, Japan, South Korea, um, would be the two major allies I could think of that that would have effect here. But if uh, the U.S. takes a very hostile approach towards North Korea, then these countries feel like they're going to be defended by the U.S. nuclear uh, missile defense systems they have there. The THAAD missiles, I believe, are the ones that are in that region. Um, they, they, they could feel a false sense of security and act more belligerently towards these other countries, believing there's no way a nuclear bomb will ever get through. However, if these systems don't work very well, then a nuclear bomb may even be like to get through those those defense systems so this is it's just important things for us to understand no it's a narrative that i don't know if our politicians ever directly lie to us about but they definitely lead us to believing a false narrative and uh, and allow us to do that and so this is important for us to know the truth here 
Another story coming out of the home front is that the State Department approves nearly $300 million in weapon sales to the Peshmerga. The Peshmerga or are the Iraqi Kurdish group who uh, have been fighting ISIS in the north of Iraq. I think that the Peshmerga isn't quite as a uh, cohesive as a unit as uh, the media likes to make them out but for our purposes today we could just call them the Peshmerga and say that these are the people getting the weapons Uh, these are offensive weapons these aren't just like uh, troop carriers and things like that there are Humvees but there's well over 4,000 M4s we're sending and a whole bunch of other weaponry and uh, i guess this is going to be for the Kurds to uh, probably try to defend Kirkuk from the ISIS. I know ISIS has uh, had some eyes and ambitions towards Kirkuk. I guess there's an Arab town southwest of Kirkuk that uh, it is a hotbed for ISIS and there's a lot of ISIS fires that come out of there. So if the Kurds hope to defend Kirkuk from ISIS, they mean, may need that. However, I think the bigger uh, threat to the the Iraqi Kurd, the Peshmerga at this point is probably the Iraqi government itself. And so it's interesting that the U.S. is giving the weapons to the, the Kurdish factions now and uh, earlier in the fight when they were really taking lands from uh, ISIS. The Iraqi Kurds, the Peshmerga forces have not entered Mosul. They kind of um, set up a barrier around the north of uh, Mosul, I believe, from probably from like the the Iraqi Kurdish region uh Kirkuk and, and that whole uh region Erbil I believe is up there as well all the way to uh Mount Sinjar and they also have uh cut off some of the road between Mosul and Tel Afar which is kind of the road to Raqqa in Syria so it seems to me like the the weaponry the Kurds have now has certainly held them uh to what they're doing so maybe they need just replenish forces I'm not sure but I'm guessing that this could uh pose a problem for I, maybe not the United States, but certainly the U, U, U.S. bat Iraqi government, if they ever hope to reclaim some of the lands that the Kurds have gotten out of this uh, this whole mess with ISIS. Uh, the Iraqi government controlled like the city of Kirkuk and a lot of other ran, uh, lands in the north of Iraq. However, when ISIS came and took the lands, the Kurds came down and took them uh, from ISIS, and the Kurds stayed. They're not giving it back, and so they they have lands outside of Mosul. They have you know lands all the way down to Kirkuk, all the way to Sinjar. Well, it'll be interesting, I guess, to see what happens long term if the if the Kurds do look for independence. Is the Iraqi government going to allow this? Even Erdogan uh, made a comment about uh, not being happy with the Iraqi Peshmerga. Uh, having independence uh in that area and uh erdogan actually lights the uh, I- iraqi kurds it- it's not like the relationship they have with the ypg and the pkk and the syrian kurds where it's very hostile and uh erdogan kind of sees and turkey sees those kurdish forces as equivalent to isis uh the, the iraqi kurds are-, are the friends of the uh turks and so it may just be that uh erdogan in turkey feels that if the Iraqi Kurds gain independence and it's going to be harder for them to deny independence to the Syrian and and Turkish Kurds as well. So, so we'll see what happens there, but it is a pretty big weapon sale and it's a notable one and something that doesn't make many headlines. So keep that in mind. Other news coming out of the West is that we have a uh, terrorist attack occurring in France. Uh, on the, I guess, scale of things, it's not a, a huge terrorist attack. You know, we don't have hundreds of people dying. We don't have bombs going off all over the city. We have a uh, gunman that attacked the police and killed one police officer, wounded a couple more, and died himself. ISIS has claimed responsibility for this attack. And so, as, as always, whenever one of these attacks occurs, it's an important and a good opportunity for us to talk about blowback uh I think un, uh, unknown to a lot of American people, Francis had a pretty heavy involvement against fighting jihad and just intervening in North Africa, especially Mali and Algeria, um, areas really that are west of Libya and Tunisia in that area. France is heavily involved. France was one of the big, uh, actually one of the big countries that pushed for the Libya intervention that the U.S. engaged in. And I've even heard it uh, called that you know, the U.S. kind of uh, did that for the French government so uh the libya war there so so all this is good to know and important to know and so this is this like i said this is an opportunity for us to talk to people and say hey i you know i know this attack is terrible i know it sucks that uh an innocent police officer was killed by a gun wielding isis lunatic however this these kind of things are going to happen so long as the west is intervening in the middle east and north africa and other areas around the world 
and we could you know say as flatly that uh it seems like the the 20th century and before all those times before including you know what happened with america and that's simply that imperialism doesn't work and you can't rule uh people from other other parts of the world you can't impose your culture on them you can't impose your values on them you can't impose your your laws and trade sanctions and all that upon these people they had their own culture they had their own lives they had their own customs and let them do what they want to do so long as they're not hurting you and a lot of times what happens is that these people want to have more either financial or cultural independence from the west and the west pushes back on that and that leads to conflict between the two countries and now we can point and say oh look see there's isis and isis is a threat to the west so we have to get involved but but in reality uh this never would have occurred if the imperialism didn't happen in the first place uh the middle east has certainly been a bigger mess since woodrow wilson's war world war one and uh the carving up of the middle east uh by the french and the british really uh in the ways they wanted to creating lines in the sand that led to conflicts that we're still suffering from today and at the same time we also need to realize that if we do back out of these countries then there's going to be an awful lot less hostility against the western powers and uh if we do that i think things can actually get better for the west and we don't have to worry about these terrorists attached so much but uh, once again i've talked about this before but whenever you look at who benefits from the war on terror it's the terrorists and the governments it's not the people in either country we have an interesting story coming out about Trump calling and congratulating Erdogan on the win in Turkey on the referendum. The uh, referendum vote gave Erdogan a whole lot more power over the Turkish government, essentially giving him the ability to dis- dismiss the Turkish parliament, which is equivalent to the U.S. Congress uh, in a lot of ways. I think he now has a lot of power over judges and the ability to dismiss judges. They continue giving him uh, the emergency powers. But one of the things that the U.S. always kind of said was that, you know, Turkey was the... Uh, Uh, Muslim or Arab democracy I forget how they always phrased it but now we're seeing uh, Turkey move away from democracy and away from what we would consider kind of western values of you elect Congress and Congress passed the law the executive branch enforces the law uh, etc all that stuff we learned in you know fourth and eighth grade or whatever whenever we had civets um and, and Trump called and congratulated Erdogan and said, hey, good win on this. Uh, interesting because even when the coup happened uh, in July under President Obama, Obama or anybody in the White House didn't make a statement about the coup until it was already clear that Erdogan was going to win the coup. So very interesting on, on how this is playing out. In previous episodes, I had talked about how I had thought Trump was going to move towards some of these uh, bigger personality leaders like Duarte in Philippines, Putin, uh, Kim Jong-un, and Erdogan. And it looks like, at least with Erdogan, he is moving closer. Maybe this is a way to placate uh, Erdogan because it does look like uh, that the Kurds are going to have a uh, at least some U.S. support in Syria for the foreseeable future, and I know he can't be happy about that, so, so maybe that's a trade-off there. One of the big stories coming out of Turkey post-referendum uh, is that Erdogan is going to look to reinstate the death penalty. Uh, this may not seem like a huge issue to most Americans, but it has a lot of implications, and this move kind of shows that Erdogan is moving away away from uh, at least Europe to become a member of the European Union you do have to be a state that does not have the death penalty so the, Turkey actually abolished the death penalty 15 years ago in order to try to become a member of the EU in that time Turkey has not became a member of the EU but membership has always been flowing out there as a as a potential possibility for uh, Turkey to join the EU and this does look like uh, Turkey and Erdogan saying we don't want to be a part of uh, the European Union anymore. I also think we should probably have some concerns about maybe a bloodbath going on in Turkey. Erdogan has already shown that he's willing to round people up and throw them in jail. Uh, over 40,000 people in jail, over 100,000 people having lost their jobs and so if he does decide that it's advantageous for him to go ahead and start chopping and heads off everybody he thinks of as uh, a gulenist part of the coup who want who wanted to overthrow Erdogan uh, last summer that that could be a problem it could get awfully bloody in Turkey and that's just something to be concerned about also just with the divide between Turkey and the EU uh, what's going to go forward uh, with NATO does Turkey want to leave NATO uh, maybe sees itself aligning more with Russia on some issues I'm not sure but these are all questions that will arise as Erdogan takes power and has the ability to move Turkey in whatever direction he wants in South America, we had the Venezuelan government seizing a GM plant, a General Motors car manufacturing plant. They had one open in 
uh, Venezuela. Apparently, the the plant wasn't selling or uh, selling cars too well down in South America, so they actually stopped manufacturing cars in 2015. However, they have been manufacturing parts since. I think the plant actually employed like some 22,000 Venezuelans, so it will be interesting to see. Uh, I guess kind of the fallout from this I, a lot of uh, a lot of the tensions with cuba arose after the cuban government went communist under castro and seized a whole bunch of land owned by americans and uh factories owned by americans so i don't know what trump's re- response will be he could just shrug his shoulders and say well that's the kind of the risk you take for doing business outside of america and i wouldn't necessarily disagree with that uh sentiment i i do think that the um that whenever you are as an American, if you do business outside of America or you leave America, you take risk uh, and and you kind of subject yourself to the the government of whatever country that you're in at that time. And and so I think this is one of the benefits of being an American and living in America is that we have a pretty decent legal system here, uh, at least compared to most of the rest of the world. And uh, you do have a pretty good guarantee from the government that they're not just going to seize your business one day uh, so long as you live in America. However, if you live in other countries, well, that's a risk you run. I don't think that the American people need to subsidize businesses who do uh, business outside of America, the, the protection of those businesses. And so... I guess the other response would be that, you know, Trump takes a very just kind of hawkish like, oh, they're going after our businesses and we're Americans and we got to do America. And because we're Americans, we're going to go do American stuff over there and uh, put some sanctions on Venezuela. So I hope the second doesn't happen, but uh, we, I guess we'll kind of see what the response is, if anything. News from the Middle East, we have the MIT professor releasing another report on the Syrian chemical weapons attack. This is a... Uh, uh, MIT scientist, uh, his name is Postal, and uh, basically what he did is he looked at where the attack was alleged to occur, and then the weather patterns, the time of the attack, and everything else, and he found that if uh, if if the attack occurred how the White House said, then all these people wouldn't have died, and uh, the, the, there's no way the attack could really occur how the American, uh, the, American the White House said. Uh, we have... Uh, him looking at the the way the wind blew in the open fields. I mean, he really got down and dirty in, in all this analysis and uh, determined that uh, it was impossible for, for the attack to occur this way. So once again, it raises questions as to what actually happened there. And uh, with the U.S. response of already bombing Assad, I doubt we're going to get the truth out of the White House. I, I mean, I suppose it's possible that the White House is, for whatever reason, distorting the evidence or lying and Assad actually did carry out the attack but they're you know putting out fake evidence because the real evidence is somehow important to national security or some other crap like that but I I doubt that's the case and with so many holes being punched in the White House story already I think we gotta start to conclude that this probably wasn't done by Assad The Trump administration, the media, everybody who uh, deals with these reports obviously wants to turn American public opinion against Assad. Uh, The White House seems to want to escalate in Syria against Assad. And if that's the case, then they could just put out the true information of how the attack occurred and why Assad's responsible, if he is responsible. But the information they put out clearly doesn't implicate Assad. Other news coming out of Syria is we had the Syrian Kurds uh, saying they have plans to uh, set up a, uh, a governing council in Raqqa once they take that city from ISIS. I don't know how long it's going to take Raqqa from ISIS, so the, this plan could... Things could certainly change an awful lot before this plan takes place. They haven't even really started the assault against Raqqa. They kind of just had this mission where they're uh, surrounding and enclosing on Raqqa. However, I think Raqqa is one of the uh, more uh, heavily... Uh, defended ISIS cities. It, it seems to be the city that ISIS has really wanted to defend more than any of the cities in Iraq or in uh, in Syria as of now. And so, it, I mean, there there could be nothing left of the city by the time the the forces get there. I mean, this is the Syrian Democratic Forces, so there are some Arab troops embedded with the the Kurdish troops, but I think it's pretty heavily Kurdish. And uh, this this would mean Kurds ruling an Arab city. I don't know how that's going to work out or what the long-term plans are uh, for uh, if, if the Kurds plan to rule the city from now until the end of time or if they plan to eventually give it back to Assad or allow it to uh, them to rule themselves. I, who knows? I, I think 
the, the most important part is that we do have the U.S. bad forces in the area indicating that the that once Raqqa is taken by them, that they're not going to give that ground back to Assad. That almost seems to be a shift in U.S. policy away from where they were prior to the chemical weapons attack. Uh, it, it does seem like the White House is just moving further and further away from Assad based on what is likely fake news. In Africa, we have a couple of stories. We have the hunt for Kony, Joseph Kony, uh, ending. The U.S. commander in Africa said that Kony had been taken off of the battlefield. I don't exactly know what that means. Uh, reading between the lines, it kind of sounded like maybe either his own men killed him or kind of retired him. Uh, I don't know how they would have done that. But anyways, uh, apparently he's no longer uh, fighting himself and... Uh, but I guess his group, I'm not sure if that is Boko Haram or a group related to Boko Haram, uh, is still active uh, in that area. It kind of, I guess it, one of the reasons I want to talk about this story is it just showed the other utter incompetence and failures of America's ability to intervene overseas. I mean, we had the we have one guy we're looking for in Africa. We have uh, the, not the entire. Uh, arsenal of the u.s military there but we have a lot of resources that we could dedicate to finding and tracking down this guy and we couldn't do it it was five years remember coney 2020 or 2012 yeah 2012 uh and, and so it just goes goes to show how we really can't accomplish the foreign policy missions that we say we want to in egypt we have uh the egyptian government killing 19 isis members in the sinai the Sinai is kind of that area where Egypt uh, meets with Israel uh, in, in like kind of transitions from Africa into Asia there. Uh, I, I think that this is kind of being made out to be a big story because they say they killed three top ISIS commanders. But we always have to remember they're always saying they killed the top Al Qaeda or the top ISIS guys. And it never does anything. I mean, remember Obama was bragging about how he got Osama bin Laden back in 2011. And now we're, we're dealing with ISIS. ISIS, the jihadists have still a significant land area that they're holding in uh, Iraq and Syria and other areas uh, in Libya and Egypt and all over the like the, just the Middle East and North Africa and, and yet we pretend like killing leadership matters it doesn't anytime you see a story saying that we killed a significant member of some terrorist organization just in order because you know the the Nets uh, the Nets beard in line will come up and, and rule just like the previous one in Afghanistan. We have news that the U.S. is fighting near the site where the Moab was dropped uh, in the Nagahar provident, province on ISIS. There, uh, I think just the most important por- portion of this story just goes to show you could drop as many bombs as you want uh, in Afghanistan. You're never gonna get rid of the terrorists there. We have a story saying that ISIS used chemical weapons against Iraqi forces. Apparently, these are Iraqi forces where there uh, were U.S. commanders and Australian commanders associated with those forces. As far as I could tell, no uh, U.S. or Australian uh, like officers were killed or hurt in this attack. Once again, just interesting to know the, the, how Trump's reaction differs uh, when it's politically uh something that he wants to do like bomb Assad suddenly he cares about you know people using chemical weapons and the death of children but when it's not then it's you know shrug your shoulders we're just gonna kind of keep doing what we're doing against ISIS anyway last thing I want to say for today uh as far as the foreign policy news is don't forget about Yemen we have the UN's uh food organization coming out and saying that some areas of Yemen are uh famine like I really think that the UN has done everything it could to cover up Saudis uh, and the U.S. war crimes in Yemen. And uh, to this extent, we have really hidden uh, a lot of the famine and uh, the the starvation of the people of Yemen uh, in order to to cover up the crimes because of Saudi Arabia that is starting them. We did see the Trump administration making (laughs) some very, very, very tiny um indication that you know saudi arabia can't just kill civilians at will they said the u.s is going to send more weapons that saudi arabia needs to say they're going to try not kill uh, civilians at this point the most important humanitarian issue and if you don't want to kill civilians in yemen the most important issue is that you need to uh stop the saudi uh invasion of the port of Fataya. If, if that port does uh, come under fire from Saudi Arabia, it's likely going to mean the starvation of a lot of people in northern Yemen. So the, these are the stories. This is what's going on. Uh, maybe I'll try to talk about Yemen in a little bit more detail one day next week. Uh, 
but it, it's just kind of been a status quo of more people are starving every day in Yemen and the situation is not getting better. So there's not a whole lot of new stuff to say, but I always want to mention Yemen because that's where 400,000 babies are starving to death. So it's, it's a very important situation. Uh, it's a, it's a, once again, like I said, Obama could have ended the war and uh, the Saudi war in Yemen anytime he want and Trump can as well. And, uh, neither men are brave enough and, uh, to stop and say, we're not going to let these children die. All right. That'll wrap up for the show today. If you like the show, please share the show on Facebook. Uh, if you're listening to it on the foreign policy focus, uh, LIBSYM page of share buttons right there, click it, click share, and, uh, it'll get out to more people. If you're listening on iTunes or anywhere else, you could either go to my Facebook page, Kyle's Files, or you could go to uh, Foreign Policy Focus, com and uh, click the share button from there. If you're not on social media, you just talk to somebody, <laughs> socialize like uh, we used to, and say, hey, check out this podcast, give them the URL, and tell them to check that out. Uh, subscribe on iTunes, everyone, that will help the show to grow. I do have quite a few good reviews up there now. And uh, follow me on Twitter at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. Oh, and uh, join the private Facebook group. That's a pretty cool thing we got going. We talk in there about foreign policy news and events, and the bigger it gets, the better discussions we'll have. So, uh If you're interested in foreign policy stories, consider joining the group. Thanks, everybody.